Well, good morning, everybody, and lovely to see you and to welcome you to our communion service this morning and also to those of you online. Well done for making it here on time, or at least I'm hoping none of you have been here for an additional hour beforehand, but it is lovely to see you. We unfortunately don't have any tea and coffee after the morning service, um, but uh, we are very glad to uh, see you and to welcome you. Um, For our communion today, uh, we operate an open table, so anyone is welcome to join us in communion if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's not a denominational tie. The other thing is, is that the way we'll do it today is there'll be a couple of folks down the front, and if you can circle round the church, through that door, round there, and in this door, bread and wine. So there's a nice circuit. And if anyone else is uh, needing it delivered to them, you just stay where you are, and that's fine, and folks will see you and come and offer it to you, okay? And I'll repeat that later on. Uh, Any other intimations, Davey, please? Good morning. morning. Um, First from the coffee team, the team that organized Friday's church coffee morning would like to thank the congregation and church friends who supported it. They hope that all who attended it enjoyed uh, it tremendously. The amount raised was £227.50, 
and we're also grateful to Helen and her team for organizing the event. Today we celebrate communion and all are welcome at the Lord's table. There will be a retiring offering at the end of the service for the Benevolent Fund and the bowls will be placed on the table at the front door. There will be a communion service this evening in church at 6.30 p.m. All are welcome. Operation Christmas Child next week is the tabletop sale uh, next Saturday, 10 o'clock to 12 noon in the hall. And the following Saturday, the 11th of November, is the shoebox packing day. That's in the hall, 10 a.m. to 12 uh, noon. Now, is that 2 p.m., Eileen? Or? Yeah, 10, 10 a.m. to 2, 2 p.m. A reminder to the elders, a Kirk session meets in the hall on Thursday, the 9th of November. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Let's join together in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to hear you speak to us in word and sacrament. You choose to give yourself to us in the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. He lived so we could see your handiwork in our own kind. He died so we could understand the depth of our need and the height of your grace. He rose again and lives so we can know the promise of your eternal love, the hope of a new begin beginning, and all the fullness of life with you. O oh Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we give you glory because you are due all honor. We recognize today that part of your mercy is letting us go our own way, even when it causes you pain to see your children squander their inheritance. We acknowledge that pain. We ask for your forgiveness. Lord, you do so much for us, and yet we fail to follow where you lead. We fail to love one another as you have loved us. We fail to love even as we love ourselves. O oh God, in our words, our actions, our thoughts, we're disgraced. So help us to turn from our past, to hand over our guilt, and grant to us clean souls as we come to worship you anew, that through the power of your forgiveness, we would enter into the light of holiness. And so send down your Holy Spirit in power today. Reveal your will for our lives and transform us. Open our hearts and our minds to receive that which we do not deserve. Aid us so we would not let this moment slip past us, but may it be for us the beginning of a wonderful new phase in our lives of greater worship, service, and relationship with you. And so we ask all of this in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us turn to God again in song as we acknowledge his love for us. Here is love vast as the ocean. <laughs> Fiction fountains open deep and wide. 
like to invite Robert Marr to come and give us our reading for this morning. Today's reading is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, and verses 34 to 46. This can be found in the Pew Bible at page 828. The Great Commandment. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. And he said to them, How is it then that David in the spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, How is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any questions. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let's pray together, shall we? Lord God, we thank you for your scriptures as they testify to the word, Jesus Christ. And as we invite him into our lives again this morning, we ask for understanding, a depth of realization, and assurance through your Holy Spirit of all that Jesus has done and provided for us today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a group of friends who went out hunting, and they paired off into twos for the day. And at night time, the hunters gathered back around the fire, and they really hadn't been terribly successful, and it was a bit frustrating. But one of the pairs, well, I say one of the pairs, one of the men returned alone, weighed down by a huge deer. And the others were very excited about this to start off with and then said, well, where's Harry? Oh, well, Harry had a stroke of some kind and he's a couple of miles back up the trail. What, you left Harry there in the dark and carried the deer back? Well, said the hunter, I figured that no one was going to steal Harry. (laughs) Sometimes we get our priorities mixed up and we we need to be reminded about what is important. In today's passage, Jesus does just that with those that come to test him about the law. Um, He is continuing these encounters that we we began last week and and over the past few weeks in in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, The encounters with, well, the first group was the Pharisees, Uh, who were the religious law creators, the traditionalists. Then we have the Sadducees, who were aligned with the Roman oppressors. They were the progressives. And within both groups, um, uh, individuals known as the scribes, they were those who were keepers of the records, of the histories. And the lawyers, those were who were experts in debating, teaching, 
and writing the law of the day. And all the, the things that they come to Jesus with are, are, are questions, trick questions, trying to trip him up so they can persecute him. And so in our passage for today, they ask the question, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Or to, to put it in a way that they probably more intended it, what law justifies all the rest? What law has the quality to make all the laws worthwhile? At the time uh, when Jesus was around Israel, there was a school of thought that held that in the Ten Commandments, the Third Commandment was uh, the one that, that, that really set the, the tenor for the lot. And the Third Commandment is that you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. It's what we would consider the blasphemy one now, but at that time, it was the one about honoring God. And if you honor God, then you'd follow all the rest of the laws, was how they saw it. Jesus didn't give that answer. Like last week, where he ignored the premise of the question and stepped away from it, he does the same again here. And he brings in wisdom of his relationship with God, that the laws themselves cannot justify the laws themselves. He says to them, it's not the quality of the laws that matter, but it is the principle of love that makes the laws worthwhile. He draws it down into two statements, pulling from Deuteronomy 6 and Leviticus 19. Love God, love others. That's what he's saying. Basically, love God and love others. Part of what Jesus does, as we hear in the, the letters of Paul, is not to uh, uh, abolish the law, but to fulfill it, to make it complete. Uh, and Jesus indicates in Matthew 19 that the law was given because of the hardness of their hearts, that it really shouldn't have been a necessary thing, that we as creation of God should have been soft-hearted enough to love God and love one another. But we make a mess of it. And so we needed to have the laws, the rules, to help us out. But the people of Jesus' day had this pattern the wrong way around. They thought that, you know, if you had the laws and you had the rules, then that meant that you loved God. The Pharisees particularly, uh, uh, setting up all the different rules and the extra rules beyond that, uh, made it so that only those who followed the law were those that loved God. And Jesus comes to break that pattern, to free us from that, so that it's love first, and then the rules, if you want the rules, if we need them. Augustine in the third century writes about this, and he says, basically, the Christian way is to love God and do as you please. What do you think of that? Love God and do as you please. Because if we're loving God, then whatever we please to do will be the things that please God. So it pleases God for us to gather together like this. And in loving God, that's what we're going to do. It's important then, I think, when we're looking at what Jesus is saying here, to understand what it is that he means by love. And I'm not planning on going down the route of C.S. Lewis today, because I've done that before, uh, where you know, we talk about sacrificial love and brotherly love and love like liking things and love of charity, of giving to others, and where we end up with the agape of sacrificial love. And while it would be appropriate to talk about sacrificial love, given that we're doing communion today, we're not going to do that. Instead, I want to talk about a little bit of the attributes of love and how they are connected to us. Because it, it matters how we understand our relationship with that, that word. I was doing a wedding yesterday, and as part of the wedding, uh, the family had chosen to use 1 Corinthians 13, uh, which you all know, obviously, is love is patient and kind, love does not envy and is not boastful, it's not arrogant or rude, etc., etc. And if we can have the slide up uh, that should be there, there we go. So there you've got 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 8, which is the bit that very often gets brought up at weddings. A um, bit of a difficult passage to have brought up at weddings. I don't think couples fully appreciate it. They say, oh, well, it's all about love, and what we're doing is about our love. And it's like, yeah, but this is a hard list. Have you read it? 
Do you know what it's asking you? And there's always a secret uh, thing within me that, that wonders which one of them picked it and what they're trying to say to their partner rather than what they're looking at themselves. You know, oh, I'm not sure, husband-to-be of mine, whether you're that patient and kind. Are you really listening? Or the converse, I'm not sure, lady love of mine, if you're not rejoicing over my wrongs a little bit too much. Have you noticed this passage? And I'm sure it's not that, but it's a hard passage for us to deal with. Because none of us can fulfill it, can we? If we really look at it, we can try, we can try to live up to it, but we we will not fulfill it. I'm not patient, I'm sorry folks. I try my best, but I'm not patient. I try my best, but I get irritable and resentful. I'm sorry folks, I can't help it. I try. And I'm sure that you have bits within this that resonate with you. The problem really is is that this passage isn't describing the love that we have for one another. This passage is describing God's love, who God is. And as you look at this, you can take that word love and you can replace it with God because in in one of John's letters he says, you know, God is love. So can you read, God is patient and kind. God doesn't envy or boast. God's not arrogant or rude. Yeah? And you can listen to it as who God is. God endures all things. God never ends. What also we can replace it with is the word perfection. Because that is who God is. Perfection is patient and kind. Perfection does not envy or boast. That's what makes this passage hard for us. Because we can't live that perfection. Jesus, who is God, Jesus, who is perfect, this passage is about him. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy or boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. Because of what we share in communion, because of the love that we have for Christ, because of what Christ did on the earth, this is given to us. It's not something you have to fulfill. The old-fashioned word is imputed. It's something that is passed on to you. So I can say, as I read this passage, I can say, because of Jesus, I am patient and kind. Because of Jesus, I don't envy or boast. Because of Jesus, I'm not arrogant or rude. Because of Jesus, I don't insist on my own way. I'm not irritable and resentful. And you can read the rest of it for yourselves. Because of Jesus, you are not these things. There's a a movement that works within this. When we want to understand love, we need to understand God. And as we understand God, we see his perfection. And as we see his perfection, we realize we're not it. And we see Jesus fulfilling it for us so that we can be it. So that love comes first, and then the rules follow on afterwards. It's important too, I think, that you know, this list here is, is one that Paul's written down, and obviously you know, it's got, there's many more things that we could describe love as. Um, love is getting up early in the morning and bringing your partner a cup of coffee. Uh, love is uh, doing the dishes when someone else is tired. Uh, love is uh, getting a wee present for someone. Love is looking out for them when they're sick. You know, all kinds of different things, can't we? I think it's important, too, that given the way that love's used these days um, very loosely and attached to all kinds of things, it probably isn't appropriate, too, that we also understand love as, as who God is when we don't like him too. They're not just the lovely things of God, but the troubling things too, that God is justice and faithfulness. God is mercy and wrath. God is power and hope and grace, and so is love. Our definition for love begins with God, not with ourselves. Anyway, all of it culminates. All this idea of love culminates in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection as the greatest expression of God and also the greatest expression of humanity. No greater love than one should lay down his life for his friends. And ultimately, what can become ours? 
as we grow closer to God. So communion is that space in which we're drawn back into these principles. Here, law is fulfilled. Love is yours. Because of your hard-heartedness, Christ had to die so that we could have imputed to us soft-heartedness and freedom and life and forgiveness. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we thank you for your mercy to us. By standing in our place, we can stand in yours and have that love that was there well before any hardness of heart and any rules. Lord, help us today to love you and do as we please. To love God and love others as ourselves. And in receiving this communion, again, participating with it, to know that love deep in our hearts. And as we share it with one another, know that we are connected, not just here in this room, but in all rooms across the world and throughout time, past, and future where this celebration is done. Only by your love. Amen. We're going to sing again as we reflect on the love of God and Christ with the hymn, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. So let's stand and sing.
be seated. And let us pray together. Our Lord God, as we come to you today, we offer to you ourselves. And as we do, we offer our time, our talents, our treasures, and we ask that you would take them, take us, and bless us, and use us for your kingdom's increase here in Annan, across Scotland, and around your world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'd like to invite Robert to lead us in our prayers for others. Thank you. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you that you are a God of love and assurance. We lift before you a word, a world which is broken and in need of your love and care. Bring hope for all those who cannot see an end to their struggling and despair. The vulnerable, the oppressed, the marginalized. We pray for those living under the shadow of war, for those who have fled their homes seeking sanctuary and shelter. We pray for their protection, comfort, and peace. We bring before you all those living under the threat of debt, poverty, and violence. We pray that you may experience justice. We pray for those who cannot be with us today, the sick, the lonely, and the depressed. Help us make our church a beacon of hope, searching out to those in need. We remember those who govern the country, the politicians, the diplomats, that they will be truthful, just, and caring. The kings and queens of other, and other leaders of our world that they will do what is right and just. We pray for those who are experiencing bereavement, that you will bring comfort. We take a moment's silence now to pray for those closest to us, whose names are written on our hearts. Empower us all in whatever way we can to work to bring relief, peace and care to every situation we encounter. In the name of Lord Jesus, our Saviour, we lift our prayers to you, Lord God our Father. Amen. Let us sing our communion hymn, Psalm 24. Ye gates, lift up your heads, ye doors, as we enter into this time of sharing and participating in Christ our Savior. Let's stand and sing.
Please be seated. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you give immeasurably so that we can receive. You know our hurts and our pains. You see the inmost secret parts of our lives and hearts and you choose to forgive, to embrace, to delight in us. Merciful God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things that pass human understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you above all things, will cherish your promises, hearing the truth of your mercy within them, that which exceeds all that we desire. And so we ask these things through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose again for us, so we would be set free from the power of sin and death itself. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Hear the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper as recorded by Paul. The tradition which I handed on to you came to me from the Lord himself, that on the night of his arrest, the Lord took bread, and after giving thanks to God, broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this in memory of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Let's stand together as we proclaim ourselves, our faith, and the faith of all Christians around the world. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on these, your gifts of bread and of wine. Make them be for us the physical image of the spiritual reality, the body and blood of Christ. Let us become for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood, and by your Spirit make us one with Christ and one with each other. And as we pray for this oneness, we join together to say the words that you, Jesus, gave us as your family. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks for it, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. servants have been served, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Remember, it's out that door, round, and then bread and wine and grains there to lead people if necessary.
pray together, shall we? Oh Lord, we thank you that you meet us in the things of every day. That of body and blood, that of bread and wine. And in these simple elements, you come yourself transformed so that we can participate in you and receive and be transformed likewise. Oh God, they are symbols of the change in us and we praise you for them. That you have encouraged us to this celebration. You have drawn us to this table because of your sacrifice on the cross. Because of your resurrection, you feed us with this spiritual food. And so we pray that you would bind us together in your love with all around the world, past, present, future, those who celebrate with us in heaven. Those near and dear to us. May you keep us in this holy fellowship. May we live always to your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you, O Father, and the Holy Spirit, be glory and praise world without end. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn for our time together as we take our worship and this blessing out into the world. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Let's stand and sing.
And to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory and majesty, power and authority. And so that blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with each of you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.